Christopher Quarles, College Professor and Master Detective by Percy James Brebner The Conundrum of the Golf Links I have wondered sometimes whether I have ever really liked Christopher Quarles. At times I have certainly resented his treatment, and had he been requested to make out a list of his friends, quite possibly my name would not have figured in the list unless Zena had written it out for him. Some remark of the professor's had annoyed me at this time, and I had studiously kept away from Chelsea for some days, when one morning I received a telegram. If nothing better to do, join us here for a few days. Quarles, Marine Hotel, Lingham. I did not even know they were out of town, for Zena and I never wrote to each other, and I had a strong suspicion the invitation meant that the professor wanted my help in some case in which he was interested. Still, there would be leisure hours, and I had visions of pleasant rambles with Zena. If I could manage it, some of them should be when the moon traced a pale gold path across the sleeping waters. I may say at once that some moonlight walks were accomplished, though fewer than I could have wished, and that although there was no business behind the professor's invitation, my visit to Lingham resulted in the solution of a mystery which had begun some months before and had baffled all inquiry ever since. Lingham, as everybody knows, is a great yachting center, and as I journeyed down to the east coast, I wondered if yachting interested Quarles, and if not, why he had chosen Lingham for a holiday. The professor was a man of surprises. I have seen him looking so old that a walk to the end of the short street in Chelsea might reasonably be expected to try his capacity for exercise, and again I have seen him look almost young. Indeed, in these reminiscences... I have shown that at times he did not seem to know what fatigue meant. When he met me in the vestibule of the Marine Hotel, he looked no more than middle-aged, and as physically fit as a man could be. He was dressed in loose tweeds and wore a pair of heavy boots, which even to look at almost made one feel tired. "'Welcome, my dear fellow,' he said. "'But why bring such infernal weather with you?' It began to blow at the very time he must have been leaving town, and it has been increasing ever since. It has put a stop to all racing. I didn't know you took an interest in yachting. I don't. Golf, Wigan. At golf I am an enthusiast. There is a good sporting course here. That's why I came to Lingham. You've brought your clubs, I see. Chance. You did not say anything about golf in your wire. Why should I? Useless waste of money. I remembered your telling me once that you never went for your holiday without taking your clubs. We shall have grand sport. He laughed quite boisterously, and a man who was passing through the hall looked at me and smiled. I recollected that smile afterward, but took little notice of it just then, because Zena was coming down the stairs. Before dinner that evening it blew a gale, and from windows overlooking the deserted parade we watched a sullen, angry sea pounding the sandy shore and hissing into long lines of foam, which the wind caught up and carried viciously inland. "'Isn't that a sail, a yacht?' said Zena suddenly, pointing out to sea, over which darkness was gathering like a pall. It was, and those on board of her must be having a bad time, not to say a perilous one. She was certainly not built for such weather as this, but she must be a stout little craft to stand it as she did, and they were no fools who had the handling of her. "'Blown right out of her course, I should think,' said Quarles. "'The yacht shelter in the creek to the south yonder. "'I should not wonder if that boat hopes to make the creek "'which lies on the other side of the golf course.' "'She's more likely to come ashore,' said a man standing behind us, "'and he spoke with the air of an expert in such matters. "'There's no anchorage in that creek, "'and besides, a bar of mud lies right across the mouth of it.' "'As the curved line of the sea presently hid the yacht from our view, "'the gong sounded for dinner.' a very welcome sound, and I, for one, thought no more about the yacht that night. Before morning the gale had subsided, but the day was sullen and cloudy, threatening rain, and we did not attempt golf until after lunch. It was an eighteen-hole course, and might be reckoned sporting, but it was not ideal. There was too much loose sand and a great quantity of that rank grass which flourishes on sand dunes. It said much for the management that the greens were as good as they were. 
i had just played two holes with the professor before i remembered the man who had smiled in the hall of the hotel yesterday certainly quarles was an enthusiast in all the etiquette of the game he was perfect but as a player he was the very last word he persisted in driving with a full swing usually with comic effect he was provided with a very full complement of clubs and was precise in always using the right one but he seemed physically incapable of keeping his eye on the ball and constantly hit out as if he were playing cricket yet the bigger ass he made of himself the greater seemed his enjoyment he never lost his temper other men would have emptied themselves of the dregs of their vocabulary quarles only smiled cheerfully explaining how he had come to top a ball or why he had taken half a dozen shots to get out of a bunker no wonder the man in the hotel had laughed there was one particularly difficult hole the bogey was six it required a good drive to get over a ridge of high ground beyond was a brassy shot and then an iron and a mashy onto the green to the left lay a creek a narrow water course between mud my drive did not reach the ridge on top of which was a direction post and the professor pulled his ball which landed perilously near the mud it took him three shots to come up with me and when at last we mounted the ridge we saw there was a man on the distant green which lay in a hollow surrounded by bunkers behind which was the bank of the curving creek four shouted quarles i almost laughed it was certain the man would have ample time to get off the green before the professor arrived there quarles waited for a moment but the man ahead took no notice possibly had not heard him the professor took a full swing with his brassy and for a wonder the ball went as straight and true as any golfer could desire i am getting into form wigan he exclaimed what is that fool doing yonder for this time the man looked round and waved to us to come on which we did slowly for quarles's form was speedily out again the man on the green was a curiosity thirty-five or thereabouts i judged him to be a thin man but wiry with a stiff figure and an immobile face which looked as if he had never been guilty of showing an emotion his eyes were beady and fixed you his mouth gave the impression of being so seldom used for speech that it had become partially atrophied his costume perhaps meant to be sporting missed the mark looked as if he had borrowed the various articles from different friends and he was practicing putting with a thin-faced mashy very rusty in the head and dilapidated in the shaft he stood aside and watched quarles miss two short putts difficult he remarked i am practicing it quarles looked at the speaker then at the mashy with that why not asked the man why asked quarles if i can do it with this i can do it with anything was the answer that's true said the professor making for the next tee there was no arguing with a man of this type the tee was on top of the creek bank i was right said quarles look wigan they did make for this haven last night it was almost low water the bank on the golf course side was steep varying in height but comparatively low near the tee and an irregular line of piles stuck up out of the mud below the tops of half a dozen of them rising higher than the bank on the other side of the creek the shore sloped up gradually from a wide stretch of mud in the narrow waterway was a yacht about eighteen tons i judged that she was the same we had seen laboring in the gale last night i could not say but certainly she was much weather-marked and looked forlorn she had not had a coat of paint recently the brasswork on her was green with neglect and her ropes and sails looked old and badly cared for yet her lines were dainty and straining at her hawser she reminded me of a disappointed woman fretting to free herself from an undesirable position a yacht is always so sentient a thing and seems so full of conscious life quarles appeared to understand my momentary preoccupation don't take any notice of her he said we're out for golf i always manage a good drive from this tee this time was an exception at any rate and in fact for the remainder of the round he played worse than before if that were possible but he was perfectly satisfied with himself and talked nothing but golf as we walked back until we were close to the hotel when he stopped suddenly queer chap that on the green very do you think he came from the yacht 
I was wondering whether he hadn't escaped from an asylum, I answered. I wonder what he was doing on the green, Quiles went on. I saw no one else playing this afternoon, so he had the green to himself, except for the little time we disturbed him. When I first saw him, it didn't seem to me that he was practicing putting, and I thought he watched us rather curiously. A theory, Professor? I asked with a smile. No, no, just wonder. By the way, don't say anything to that expert who was so certain that the yacht couldn't get into the creek. He mightn't like to know he was mistaken. After dinner that evening, Zena and I went out. There was no moon. Indeed, it was not very pleasant weather. But it was a pleasant walk, and entirely to my satisfaction. When we returned, I found Quarles in a corner of the smoking room, leaning back in an armchair with his eyes closed. He looked up suddenly as I approached him. Cold out? he asked. Nothing to speak of. Feel inclined to go a little way with me now? Certainly. Good. Say in a quarter of an hour's time, I shall get out of this dress and put on some warmer clothes. I should advise you to do the same. I took his advice, and I was not surprised when he turned to me as soon as we had left the hotel and said, The yacht, Wigan, will go and have a look at her. It's too dark to see her. She may show a light, he chuckled. Anyway, we will go and have a look. We started along the front in the direction of the golf course, but at the end of the parade, instead of turning inland as I expected, to cross the course to the creek, Quarles led the way on to the sands. Here was a favorite bathing place, and there were many small tents nestling under the sand hills, looking a little the worse for last night's gale. At this hour the spot was quite deserted. "'Getting toward high water,' said the professor, "'and a smooth sea tonight. "'Can you row, Wigan?' "'An oarsman would probably say I couldn't,' I answered. "'There's a stout little boat hereabouts. "'Takes swimmers out for a dive into deep water. "'We'll borrow it and see what you can do.' "'Always there was something in Quarles' way of going to work, "'which had the effect of giving one a thrill, "'of stringing up the nerves "'and making one eager to know all that was in his mind.' You were satisfied there was something more to learn, and felt it would be worth learning. I asked no questions now, as I helped to push a good-sized dinghy into the water. Oars were in it, and a coil of rope. "'Anyone might go off with it,' said Quarles. "'I noticed the other day that the boatman did not trouble to take the oars out. I suppose he believes in the honesty of Lingham. If I am no great stylist, I am not deficient in muscle, and with the set of the tide to help me, we were not long in making the mouth of the creek.' The yacht is some way up, Wigan, and maybe there are sharp ears on her. Tie your handkerchief round that rowlock, and I'll tie mine round this. You must pull gently and make no noise. The tide is still running in, and will carry us up. By the way, when you're on holiday, do you still keep your hip pocket filled? Yes, when I go on expeditions of this sort. Good. Keep under the bank as much as possible, and don't stick on the mud. I did little more than keep the boat straight. Was careful not to make any noise and in the shadow of the bank we were not very likely to be seen. A heavy leaden sky made the night dark, and there was a sullen rush in the water. "'Steady,' whispered Quarles. We were abreast of the first of the piles, which I had noticed in the morning. Now it was standing out of the water instead of mud. "'She shows no light,' said Quarles. "'We'll get alongside.' With the incoming tide, the yacht had swung around and was straining at the hawser which held her the water slapping at her bows, with fretful insistency. Quarles held on to her, bringing us with a slight bump against her side. Keen ears would have heard the contact, but no voice challenged. We had come up on the side of the yacht, which was nearest the golf course. "'There's no boat passing to her, Wigan,' said Quarles. "'Probably there is no one on board. Let's go round to the other side.' There we found the steps used for boarding her. If there's anyone here, Wigan, we're two landlubbers who got benighted and had a bad attack of nerves, whispered Quarles. Hitch one end of that coil of rope to the painter, so that when we fasten our boat to the stays on the other side of the yacht, she'll float far astern. When they return, they are almost certain to come up on this side to the steps, so we'll not be likely either to see the rope or our boat in the dark. I fastened the rope to the painter, as Quarles suggested, and climbed onto the yacht after him. Then I let the tide carry our boat astern, and, crossing the deck, tied the other end of the rope securely to the stays on the other side. 
the sky seemed to have become heavier and more leaden it was too dark to see anything clearly there was little wind yet a subdued and ghostly note sounded in the yacht's rigging and the water swirling at her bows seemed to emphasize her loneliness so far as i could see she was in exactly the same condition as when i had seen her from the golf course no one was on deck and no sound came from below queer feeling about her don't you think said quarles we're just deadly afraid of the night and spooks that's what we are if there is anyone to question us i followed him down into the cabin at the foot of the companion quarles flashed a pocket electric torch it was only a momentary flash then darkness again as he gave a warning little hiss three glasses on the table was all i had seen i supposed the professor had seen something more but i was wrong after standing perfectly motionless for a minute or so he flashed the light again and sent the ray round the cabin the appointments were faded the covering of the long fixed seats on either side of the table was torn in places one of these seats had evidently served as a bunk for a pillow and folded blanket were lying upon it all the paintwork was dirty and scratched forward there was a door into the galley aft another door to another cabin a crew of three said quarles three glasses plenty of liquor left in the bottle in the rack yonder a pipe and a pouch and a conundrum he let the light rest on the sheet of paper lying beside the glasses on it was written s b piles one with chain ninth link n b direct bud high water ninety and four feet a conundrum wigan what do you make of it he held out the paper to me a useless thing to do since he allowed the ray from the torch to wander slowly round the cabin again we must look at the pile with the chain he muttered in a disconnected way as though he were thinking of something quite different and at the ninth link of the chain i said yes at the ninth link a conundrum wigan a he stopped his eyes had suddenly become fixed upon some object behind me the electric ray fell slanting close by me and when i turned i saw that the end of it was under the cushioned seat on one side of the table the light fell upon a golf club a rusty mashie that man on the green was one of the crew wigan said quarles and then when i picked up the club we looked into each other's eyes did not i say the yacht had a queer feeling about her he said in a whisper i knew what he meant the mashie had something besides rust on it now something wet moist and sticky quarles glanced at the door of the galley as he put the paper on the table careful to place it in the exact position in which he had found it then he went quickly to the cabin aft on either side of a fixed washing cabinet there was a bunk and in one of them lay the man we had seen on the green the wound upon his head told to what a terrible use the club had been put since he had played with it that afternoon he had been fiercely struck from behind and then strong fingers that strangled out whatever life remained in him he was fully dressed and there had been little or no struggle his would-be sportsmanlike attire was barely disarranged and even in death his pose was stiff and his set face exhibited no emotion quarles lifted up one of his hands and looked at the palm and at the nails he let the light rest upon the hand that i might see it then he pointed to a straight mark across the forehead just below the hair and nodded we were back in the saloon cabin again when i touched the professor's arm and in an instant the torch was out i had caught the sound of splashing oars put the club back under the seat said quarles and then with movements stealthy as a cat's he led the way to the galley door we were in our hiding place not a moment too soon two men came hurriedly down the companion a match was struck but there was not a chink in the boarding through which we could see into the cabin it seemed certain they had not discovered our dinghy and had no suspicion that they were not alone upon the yacht it's plain enough there's no other meaning to it the speaker had a heavy voice a gurgle in it and i judged the heavier tread of the two was his ninety feet it says captain and we measured that string to exactly ninety feet feet might only refer to the four and not to both figures was the answer in a sharp incisive voice he said it was both and i'm not sure he lied returned the man addressed as captain the distance was originally paced out no doubt and pacing out ninety feet ain't the same as an exact measurement we made allowances growled the other we'd been wiser to go on looking instead of coming back 
You're too previous, mate. You didn't trust him any more than I did. Nobody had the name right enough, answered the captain. And the time, a year last February. I always put that job down to glider. Let's get back while the dark lasts. Come to think of it, strange glider. Should have made a confidant of him, said the other. Sized him up and took his chance for the sake of the missus, returned the captain. I'm not going back until I've seen whether he's got other papers about him. He chucked his clothes overboard, said the captain. He'd keep papers tied round him, maybe. I'll soon find out. There was a heavy tread, and the opening of the door of the cabin aft. There was the rending of cloth, and the man swore the whole time, perhaps to keep up his courage for the horrible task. Nothing, he said, coming back into the saloon cabin. Say, Captain, supposing it's all a plant, a trap. There was a pause, and my hand went to my revolver. If the suggestion should take root, would they not at once search the galley? He'd a mind to get the lot. That was his game, said the captain. They went on deck. We could hear them stamping about overhead. Then came an oath and a quick movement. I thought they were coming down again, but a moment later there was the soft swish of oars, followed by silence. Carefully, said Quarles, as I fumbled at the galley door. One of them may have remained to shoot us from the top of the companion. He was wrong, but it was more than probable that such an idea had occurred to them. They had discovered our dinghy. It had been cut adrift, and the scoundrels had escaped, leaving us isolated on the yacht. I snapped out a good round oath. "'Can you swim, Wigan?' asked the professor. At full tide the creek was wide, and the sullen, rushing water had a hungry and cruel sound. "'Not well enough to venture here, and in the dark,' I said. "'And I cannot swim at all?' said quarles we are caught until morning in low water it's cold and beginning to rain with all its defects i prefer the cabin he went below and declared that he must get a little sleep whether he did or not i cannot say i know that i never felt less inclined to close my eyes we had been trapped that made me mad and i could not forget our gruesome companion behind the door of the aft cabin there was a glimmer of daylight when quarles moved this is nearly as good a place to think in as my empty room at Chelsea, Wigan. What do you make of the mystery? A trio of villains after buried treasure, which they could not find, and two of them are scuttling away to save their necks. So you think the dead man yonder fooled them? No, I think there is some flaw in the conundrum. By the way, why is a golf course called Lynx? It's a Scotch word for a sandy track near the sea, isn't it? But to an untutored mind, Wigan, especially if it were not Scotch, there might be another meaning, one based on number, for instance, as a chain consists of links, so a golf course, which has eighteen links. It is a possible view, eh? Perhaps. I see they have taken a paper, said Quarles, but I dare say you remember the wording, S.B., that means South Bank, and b north bank i have no doubt there is a pile with a chain on it whether with nine or ninety links does not matter it was on the green of the ninth hole that the man was practicing for the word link substitute hole and you get a particular pile connected with the ninth hole which of course has a flag and so we get a particular direction indicated from the high water line of the mud on the north bank we continue this ascertained direction for ninety feet and then we dig down four feet and find nothing i said exactly there is a flaw somewhere but the treasure is there said quarles the rascals who have given us an uncomfortable night evidently believe that the man they called glider had told the truth more they had already put the job down to him you will remember now yeah, how was it glider gave his secret away to the man in yonder cabin obviously he couldn't come and get the treasure himself a convict i said who gave information to a fellow convict about to be released i don't think so said quarles as a convict these men who have been convicts themselves or will be would have had sympathy with him they hadn't any they were afraid of him they felt it was strange that glider should have confided in him and could only find explanation by supposing that glider had sized him up and taken his chance for the sake of the missus 
we may assume therefore that glider had trusted a man no one would expect him to trust this suggests urgency and i fancy a man nicknamed glider has recently died in one of his majesty's prisons portland i should guess probably our adventurers sailed from weymouth now glider could not have been in portland long a year last february he was free to do the job with which this expedition is connected and of which i should imagine he is not suspected by the police probably he was taken for some other crime soon after he had committed this one he had no opportunity to dig up the treasure he had buried which he certainly would have done as soon as possible yet glider must have been long enough in prison to size up the dead man yonder a work of some time i fancy you noticed his hands did they show any evidence of his having worked as a convict you saw the mark across the forehead that was made by a stiff cap worn constantly until a day or two ago i think we shall find there is a warder missing from portland a warder the idea was startling yet i could pick no hole in the professor's argument even a warder is not free from temptation and i take it this man was tempted and fell glider no doubt told him of the captain and his mate he had worked with them before probably and trusted them also he might think they would be a check upon the warder i shouldn't be surprised if the warder were the only one of the three who insisted that the widow should have her share and so came by his death the flaw in the riddle keeps the treasure safe perhaps i shall solve it during the day by the way wigan it must be getting near low water it was a beastly morning persistent rain from a leaden sky the tide was out only a thin strip of water separating the yacht from the mud i fear there will be no golfers on the links today whom we might signal said quarles and i could not even swim that i can i answered it would be better than spending another night here said the professor send a boat round for me and inform the police i am afraid the captain and his mate have got too long a start but don't leave lingham until we have had another talk while i am alone i may read the riddle the ducking i did not mind and the swim was no more than a few vigorous strokes but i had forgotten the mud as i struggled through it squelching knee-deep quarles called to me they must have landed him at high water yesterday wigan and then crossed over and taken the direction from him i thought he was feeling about with the flag when we first saw him on the green no doubt he made some sign to the others across the creek to lie low when he saw us coming they marked the place in daylight and went at night to dig i sank at least ten inches deeper into the mud while he was speaking he got no answer out of me i felt like hating my best friend just then after changing my clothes at the hotel where i accounted for my condition by a story original but not true i told zena shortly what had happened and then sent a boat for the professor I then told the Lingham police, who wired to the police at Colchester. I also telegraphed to Scotland Yard and to Portland Prison. I did not see Quarles again until the afternoon. Have you solved the riddle? I asked. I think so. We'll go to that ninth hole at once. The police are continuing the excavations begun by our friends. I've had a talk to the professional at the golf club. They moved the position of the holes on a green from time to time, you know, Wigan, and with the professional's help, I think we shall be able to find out where it was a year last February. He is a methodical fellow. That will give us a different direction on the north bank of the creek. It was a natural oversight on the convict's part. Were I not a golfer, I might not have thought of the solution. We found the treasure a long way from where the other digging had been done. It consisted of jewels which in the early part of the previous year had been stolen from fenton hall some two miles inland the theft which had taken place when the house was full of weekend visitors had been quickly discovered and the thief finding it impossible to get clear away with his spoil had buried it on the desolate bank of the creek marking the spot by a mental line drawn through the chained pile and the flag on the golf course he must have known the neighborhood and knew this was the ninth hole or link as he called it or as the warder had written it down for quarles was right a warder was missing from portland and was found dead in that aft cabin the yacht was known at weymouth and belonged to a retired seaman a captain wells who lived at a little hotel when he was in the town he was often away sometimes in his yacht sometimes in london 
and there was little doubt that his boat had often been used to take stolen property across to the continent. Neither the captain nor his mate could be traced now, but it was some satisfaction that they had not secured the jewels. As I have said, I did manage to get some moonlight walks with Zena, but not many. For a week after we had recovered the Fenton Hall jewels, I was called back to town to interview Lord Leckenbridge. 